We're doing a meeting in Washington, D.C., and on a day off, I just had to go down to see the wall. Big, stark stone wall with thousands and thousands of names of men and women who lost their lives fighting for freedom, things that we hold so dear. And I walked down that wall looking at those names until finally I saw it. Thomas T. Norman, my best friend. And I reached out and just touched the letters, and instantly I was flooded with memories of the time that we spent together. Hours of target study, simulator practice, and then out on the football field. Tommy was the quarterback, and he could throw the tightest spiral that just settled into your hands like catching an eggshell. And then when he met Jeanette, and they were married, and little Tara came along, all of these good memories just rushed over me. You see, that's what a monument is supposed to do. It's supposed to take us back into the experience that it commemorates. That's what a monument is for. Now, God knew from the very beginning that Satan would attack his authority as the creator of the heavens and the earth. God knew that this would be the, the platform, the stage for his final warfare against God's people. And as we learned in the mid-1800s, Charles Darwin published his book, The Origin of Species popularizing the theory of evolution and the church joined hands with modern science infiltrating the ranks of God's people with a new philosophy that would in fact undermine God's authority as the creator. God knew that this would happen. And that's why at the very beginning he created a monument, a memorial to remind man forever that he is the creator. Now God knew that if he made his monument and carved it out of stone or wood, that men would either destroy it or decorate it with gold and silver and worship the monument instead of the God of the monument. And so he didn't do that. God did something else. He made his monument out of something that would forever be out of the reach of mankind and the devil. Instead of carving it out of stone, he carved his monument out of time. That's why the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, by the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from his work. And God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So God intentionally worked six days and then rested on the seventh day. And when your Bible says that God rested, that's the Hebrew word Shabbat, he Sabbath on the seventh day. So God created the Sabbath, carving it out of time as an eternal reminder that He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And the book of Revelation, picking up on that very theme in Revelation chapter 14, God, knowing what would happen in the last days, created a special package of messages to delivered by three angels. And in chapter 14, verse 6, I saw another angel flying in the midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Every living being on this earth is going to 
to have the opportunity to hear this package, God's last message. Listen to what it says. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. It's an intense time, a time of God's judgment. It's the end time. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. God's last call is for His people to worship Him as the Creator of the heavens and the earth. And we learned in Revelation chapter 13 at this very time, practically the whole world will worship the beast. The beast is the creature. God is the creator. The world will be divided between those who worship the creature and those who worship the creator of the heavens and the earth. That's why we need to take the time to understand the issues and when God said in his message, Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water, he's taking us all the way back to the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 20, when he gave his Ten Commandments to his people. And embedded in the heart of the law is a message from God with all of the authority of the Creator of the heavens and the earth. After all, who has the right to establish the law other than the Creator who made us? And so when the dragon tries to give his authority to the beast, it's just a mockery, it's just a sham, because all authority is established by the Creator of the heavens and the earth. And so in Exodus chapter 20, he said in verse 8 to his people, Remember the Sabbath day. These were people that had been slaves in Egypt, and he delivered them out of Egypt, and now they are free. They are a redeemed people. And to a redeemed people, he says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you'll labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you will not work. Why? Because, verse 11, in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he made it holy. So God is saying to those who want to live within that circle that he created, here's how I made you. Here are the principles for peace and joy and happiness. And one of those principles is to work six days and to rest with him on the seventh day. You see, God created man in his image. And there was something in the heart of God that caused him to work six days and then bless the seventh day and rest on that day. I don't know why he did that, but the fact that he did proves that there was something in his heart that made him want to do it. He, he finished. He rested on the seventh day. And then he made man in his image and says, I want you to be like me work six days and rest on the seventh day. Something in the heart of man. Now, why did God rest? Did God work so hard six days creating the heavens and the earth and then after, ooh, whew, man, I'm pooped. I need a siesta. <laughs> Is that what it was for? No. Well, why did God rest? John Paul II captured the essence of God's rest in a paper that he published years ago, Dies Domini, Apostolic Letter of the Holy Father John Paul II to the bishops, clergy, and faithful of the Catholic Church on keeping the Lord's Day holy. Listen to what he said. He said, The divine rest of the seventh day speaks, as it were, of God lingering before the very good work which his hand had wrought in order to cast upon it a gaze full of joyous delight. 
This is a contemplative gaze which does not look to new accomplishments but enjoys the beauty of what he had just achieved. Don't you like that? God worked six days and he rested. You know, my wife, she has so much talent, she can do all kinds of things. And she paints pictures too. You know, she, I don't know if you've ever seen an artist paint. Dina's up there painting and painting, and I'm looking at the picture. Looks done now, right? Nope, not done yet. Well, why not? Watch. And she gets the brush and puts a little paint on there and goes, bloop. Did you see that? No, I don't see. Well, it's not ready yet. Bloop, bloop. There's another one. I can't tell the difference. <laughs> but soon, she puts down the brush steps back and rests in the picture she had just painted. That's what God did. He created everything. The crowning act of creation was the man and the woman. And when he had finished that, he put down the brush, stepped back, and rested in what he had done. What a picture of God. John Paul II captured that beautifully. Interestingly, he goes on to say, God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy, Genesis 2-3. And that's correct. It's exactly what we just read from the Bible. But curiously, in the next paragraph, Sunday then is the day of rest because it is the day blessed by God and made holy by Him and set apart from the other days to be among them the Lord's day. Now how can he say God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Therefore, Sunday is the day that God blessed because when I look at my handy little calendar on my desk, it says the seventh day is Saturday, not Sunday. And when I open my encyclopedia that's sitting right here for me, this is the S volume, and I open it up to the word Sabbath, and even the World Book Encyclopedia says Sabbath comes on Saturday, the seventh day of the week, but today Christians observe the Sabbath on Sunday because that's the day they believe Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. But the seventh day, it says, is the Sabbath. So how can John Paul II say that God blessed the seventh day and then therefore Sunday is the day that he made holy? Well, maybe he thinks Sunday is the seventh day. Well, how could he say that? God rested. He created the man and the woman, and he rested. Sometimes people tell me, oh, well, if that's so good, I want to do every day. I want to keep holy every day. I want to rest every day. You can't do that for two reasons. One, God said, I work six days. And I rested on the seventh day, and I want you to work six days and rest on the seventh day. Working six days is just as much a part of entering into the Sabbath rest as resting on the seventh day. No lazy Christians, sorry. Can't keep every day. Can't rest in God every day like you can on the seventh day because that's the day God rested. And secondly, he did not bless any other day. The Bible tells us God blessed the Sabbath day and he made it holy. Genesis chapter 2, God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy. He did not bless the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth day. He blessed the seventh day. And he made that day holy. So we can't keep any day holy. We have to keep the day God made as holy. Now follow me. Some people try to say, well, I start my work on Monday, so my seventh day is Sunday. That's why John Paul II said that. No. It's not your seventh day that he blessed. It's God's seventh day 
that he blessed. It's not your rest that's holy. It's his rest that's holy. God rested on the seventh day. In fact, he created Adam and Eve on the sixth day. And the very first full day that Adam and Eve had on this earth was the seventh day when God was rested. So on their first day, they entered into God's seventh day rest. It's not their rest. They haven't even worked yet. It's God's rest that he wants us to enter into on his day, not ours. Hebrews. Look, Hebrews makes that clear in the fourth chapter. Go back to the, Old, the New Testament now, Hebrews chapter, chapter 4, verse 3. He says, we who have believed can enter that rest, the rest that the Old Testament saints never did enter into because in verse 3 he says, God's work has been finished since the creation of the world. Verse 4, for somewhere he had spoken about the seventh day. Which day? The seventh day in these words. On the seventh day God rested from all of his work. Therefore, verse 6, it still remains that some will enter into that rest. What rest? His rest. God's rest. Verse 9, there remains therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Because anyone who enters into God's rest rests from his own work just like God did from his. So how did God rest from his work? Because that's what we want to do to enter into his rest. We work six days and rest on the day that he blessed, made holy, set apart, and rested. God is not going to withhold a blessing from you just because you happen to be born in the New Testament times. Good news for us today. God's reminder. Well then, which day is the Sabbath day? I just read from the encyclopedia. It says the seventh day is the Sabbath day. Well, which day is that? I just read it from the encyclopedia. It said Saturday. So how come John Paul II said Sunday? Well, we're going to come to that. Just hold on. That's on page 12. I'm still on page 2. Which day? How do we know the seventh day is Saturday? Well, you could look at the encyclopedia, but I don't know about you, but that's not good enough for me. <laughs> I'd rather get it from God's Word, wouldn't you? So let's take a look. What does the Bible tell us about which day that God blessed and made holy? The New Testament makes it clear for us. Look at Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. This one's fun. Luke, the 23rd chapter. Jesus had just died, and in verse 53, they took his body down from the cross, and they wrapped it in linen cloth, placed it in a tomb. Verse 54. When did Jesus die? Verse 54. It was the preparation day. So when did he die? He died on the preparation day. And the Sabbath was about to begin. So when is the preparation day? It's the day before the Sabbath. That's when Jesus died. The preparation day, the Sabbath was about to begin. So what did they do? They went home, they prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. So when did he die? On the preparation day. What was the next day? The Sabbath. What did they do? They rested on the Sabbath. And then, chapter 24, verse 1, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they prepared, went to the tomb, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. When they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Why not? Because he had risen. He had risen. When was this? When they went to the tomb. Early in the morning. First day of the week. 
So now we have the days of the week lined up from the Bible. When did he die? The preparation day. What was the next day? The Sabbath. And then the next day, when he was raised up, what does it say? The first day of the week. Now, follow me. Practically the whole Christian world, like John Paul II said, practically the whole Christian world observes Sunday in honor of the resurrection of Jesus. Am I right or not? Are we fighting over which day is the resurrection day? Nobody's, maybe a few people, nobody's fighting over that. Practically the whole world observes Sunday, Christian world, in honor of the resurrection of Jesus. But the Bible says it was on the first day of the week. So if the resurrection day is the first day of the week, then, and the first day of the week is Sunday, then it doesn't take much of a computer to figure out that the day before Sunday, it must be the seventh day of the week, and that's Saturday. And you know that the Jews still observe Saturday today? They still do. They know when it is. Sunday, the resurrection day, the first day. Seventh day, Saturday. That's the day that God blessed and made holy. God didn't create the Sabbath and then say, well, I got a holy day here. What am I going to do? I know what I'll do. I'll make a man to keep it. <laughs> he didn't do that. He made the man on the sixth day. And then he created the Sabbath. He says, I got a man here and a woman. What am I going to do? I know what I'll do. I'll rest with them. And he created the Sabbath and gave it to us as an eternal reminder that he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Oh, what a God. No wonder the devil hates the Sabbath so much because it commemorates the thing that he can't do. <laughs> he can't create. And he hates it. By the way, when the Bible says they went to the tomb on the first day of the week, Greek lesson here, the Greek word, miaton, sabaton, is translated first day of the week. But the actual meaning of miaton, sabaton is first day after the Sabbath. So the first day after the Sabbath can't be the Sabbath. Because it's the first day after the Sabbath. Well, what kind of an example did Jesus give for us in Luke chapter 4, verse 16? He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. So what did Jesus do? He observed the Sabbath. You say, well, he was a Jew. Yes, he was. But he was also the creator of the heavens and the earth. He was also a man. And he's also our example, isn't he? And by the way, who is the true Israel of God today? Those who believe in Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. That day, that special appointment, it's a divine appointment. It comes on the seventh day of the week. A time to meet with God, celebrate who he is. Forget about all the problems of the world. Wow. He must have been looking ahead to our time and saw how badly we would need it. So Jesus went every Sabbath. God would ask me, Cologne, why did you insist on observing the seventh day instead of the first like everybody else? And I said, because Jesus did. I think that's a pretty good answer. I think God will accept that. Just follow the Lamb. Amen? May not be. He may go places we don't want to go. But follow him. And you'll always be blessed. Well, what did he teach about it anyway? In chapter 12 of Matthew, he said, 
When he went to a synagogue, he saw a man there with a shriveled hand. Verse 9, looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, the Jews asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Oh, they wanted to trap him. And he said to them, verse 11, If any of you has a sheep and he falls into a pit, aren't you going to take him out on the Sabbath day? Then how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You see, sheep was money. And one of the sheep fell in the pit. They're going to take him out because that's valuable to them. But Jesus is saying, you don't understand. A man is a lot more valuable than a sheep. So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He wasn't saying, well, you don't have to keep Sabbath anymore. New Testament's coming up. No, he taught them how to observe and enjoy a Sabbath blessing. They had attached so many traditions to the Sabbath that Jesus had to strip away their traditions and show them the true beauty of the Sabbath. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man. It was made for mankind. It was made for you. You were not made to observe the Sabbath. It was made for you to rest with me from your work like I rested from mine. And what better way to rest than to do good for other people? He was showing them how to observe the Sabbath. Well, they were not happy campers. In fact, the Bible says in verse 14, they went out and plotted how they might destroy Jesus. People get angry when you start tampering with traditions that they have attached to the Sabbath. The Pharisees did it. They've done it through the ages. People get angry when we tamper with man's traditions that he attaches to the Sabbath. Why did they get so angry? What was it that made them so angry? Romans chapter 8, verse 7, The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. You see, the reason they got angry is because they were controlled by their sinful nature. The sinful nature rebels against the things of God. It rebels against the law of God. It rebels against the good things that God made for us to enjoy within that circle that He made for us. It rebels against that. And whenever I find myself rebelling against something that I discover God made for me, I know that's my sinful nature trying to stick up its ugly head. And i got to smash it back down again and say, God, let me be led by the Spirit and not by my sinful nature. But what did Jesus command about the Sabbath? This is one, Matthew 24. This is so powerful. Here's the verse that convinced me that God still had a Sabbath blessing for us even in the New Testament times. You want to see it? I'll show you anyway. Matthew chapter 24, the disciples were looking at the temple, and they said, oh, look, how beautiful the building. They're always caught up in things. Oh, beautiful building. And Jesus said, I tell you, the time is coming, and there will not be one stone left standing on another here. When is that going to be? Give us a sign, they asked him. So Jesus gave them some signs as to when the end of the world would be and when the temple would be destroyed. And listen to what he said. When you see these signs, I want you to flee. Flee the city. Flee for your lives. And when you do, verse 20, pray that your flight will not have to take place in the winter or on the Sabbath. When you see these signs, Jerusalem is about to be destroyed, you better get out of there. But I want you to pray that it won't have to be on the Sabbath. Now, Jerusalem was destroyed. Roman general Titus destroyed that city. There wasn't a stone left on another, just like Jesus said. And that was in the year 70 A.D. Now, Jesus died on the cross in 31 A.D. So here he is, before 31 A.D., looking ahead to 70 A.D., about 40 years into the future after the cross. 
And he's saying, on that day when you have to flee, pray you won't have to flee on the Sabbath. So Jesus, this is what nailed it for me. Jesus expected New Testament Christians to still be enjoying a Sabbath rest 40 years after he died on the cross. That proves to me it was not done away with at the cross. No way. He still knew. Or maybe Jesus didn't know. Well, Jesus knew, didn't he? He made the Sabbath. He knew. Forty years after the cross. In fact, while we're talking about the command, is a neat thought, and it's in two verses. And I don't know if it's a coincidence or what, because I know the Bible didn't have verse numbers when it was written originally. But in these two verses, Acts 4.12 and James 4.12, Acts 4.12, there's no other name under heaven whereby you can be saved. What name is that? That's Jesus, isn't it? No other name except Jesus whereby you can be saved. Acts 4.12. In James 4.12, in James 4.12, the Bible says, there is one judge, there is one lawgiver, and that is he who is able to save. Now, if there's only one name under heaven whereby we can be saved, and if there's only one judge and one lawgiver, and that's the one who's able to save then the lawgiver has to be the one who is able to save. And if the one who is able to save is Jesus Christ, then the lawgiver has to be Jesus Christ. <laughs> who was it that reached down from the cloud on top of Mount Sinai and took those tables of stone out of the hands of Moses and wrote on the tables of stone with his own finger, Remember the Sabbath of the Lord your God. It was the Son of God, Jesus Christ, before he became a man. No wonder Jesus said, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Whoa, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath because he made it. It was the Son of God who made all things, we learned. It was Jesus before he became a man. Jesus who bent, bent down, formed the body from the dust of the ground, breathed into it the breath of life, watched it become a living being. It was Jesus who created man. It was Jesus who said with his tables of stone, look, here is how I made you. Here is the circle. Stay inside the circle and you will have peace and joy and happiness. Step outside of the circle and you will suffer and be hurt. It was Jesus, the Son of God. And he wrapped the Sabbath into one big package and says, here, this is for you. I made it for you. Sabbath was made for man. I'll tell you another something special about the Sabbath. We just learned Jesus died on the preparation day. That's the day before the Sabbath. And then he rested on the Sabbath day. And then he rose up again on the first day. Do you think it was a coincidence that Jesus finished his work for you and me on the preparation day and rested on the Sabbath and then rose again on the first day of the week? The Sabbath is a sign that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth, but it's also a sign that he is our redeemer and recreator in Jesus Christ. It wasn't a coincidence. That's why the devil hates the Sabbath. Well, why does almost everybody observe the first day instead of the seventh today? Surely the New Testament must have changed it. Well, let's take a look. There are eight verses in the New Testament that explicitly mention the first day of the week. Six of them we have already seen. They're all just like the one we read in Matthew that says early in the morning they went to the tomb on the first day of the week and they found the stone rolled away and the tomb was empty. There's no hint there that the Sabbath was changed from the seventh day to the first day. In fact, when it says on the first day of the week, it was on the first day after the Sabbath they went to the tomb. So it couldn't be changing the Sabbath in those six verses. But there are two others 
that are often used today to try to show that the Sabbath has been changed from the seventh day to the first. And so I want to take a look at those in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 is one of them. 1 Corinthians 16th chapter, verse 1. Paul writes to the church at Corinth. He says, now, about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. When are they to do this? On the first day of the week. And so many will point to that verse and say, you see, they were passing the collection plate in church on the first day of the week. So now they're keeping the first day instead of the seventh. But I would ask, where does it say anything about passing a collection plate in church? Listen to it again. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Does it say anything about passing an offering plate in church? In fact, in the original Greek meaning of set aside, it really means set aside by himself, not in church. And furthermore, even if there was a meeting in church, listen, when was that meeting? It was on the first day of the week. But in Greek it says on the first day after the Sabbath. So how can the first day after the Sabbath now be the Sabbath? See, it never fits. Now there's one other verse. Acts, the 20th chapter. This is a fun one. So turn there with me. Interesting story. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Now, Paul is preaching, and they're breaking bread on the first day of the week. Now we have a little worship service, church service maybe, on the first day of the week. But we have to ask a question. Just because they worshiped and preached and prayed together and broke bread together on the first day of the week, does that prove that the Sabbath has been changed? Not really, because when it says on the first day of the week, if we were reading it in Greek, remember, on the first day after the Sabbath, we came together to break bread. Well, why would they be coming together on the first day after the Sabbath? Well, that's a good question. Let's ask ourselves another question. When was this on the first day of the week? Watch. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Now, breaking bread can also mean eat. Acts chapter 2 says they came together and they broke bread every day. So that doesn't mean that it's the Sabbath. It meant they were eating. Now watch. Paul intended to leave the next day, so he kept on speaking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where they were meeting. Paul preached until midnight? And I only get to go till 8.30? <laughs> I wish that had been born in Paul's day. I could go till midnight, but don't worry, I won't do that to you. <laughs> you didn't have to say that, amen. There were lights in the upstairs room where we were meeting. When was this meeting? It was in the evening, wasn't it? It was in the evening of the first day of the week. Now, we learned that there was evening and there was morning the first day. So when does the day begin? The day in Bible times, they didn't have watches in Bible times. God didn't say, Adam... When you see Mickey's big hand go around 24 times and the little hand two times and they both end up on 12, it's a new day there. <laughs> he didn't say that. He said, Adam, when you see the sun go down in the evening, the day is over and a new day is beginning. It was evening and morning. The dark part of the day comes first. So if it was the evening of the first day of the week, then the seventh day was just coming to an end. Are you following me? The seventh day was just ending. So as in today's terms, it was Saturday, the sun set, it was Saturday night, and the first day of the week began because the dark part of the day comes first. This was a Saturday night meeting. 
It wasn't a Sunday morning worship service. Why were they meeting? Well, you'll see why. Right here, verse 9, in a few more verses, seated in the window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. <laughs> that encourages me because I sometimes see people head nod and, and they'll come apologize to me, Pastor, I'm so sorry. I, I, don't worry. They fell asleep when Paul preached. <laughs> so who am I to get upset? <laughs> they fell into deep sleep. Paul talked on and on, and when he was sound asleep, he fell out to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. And let that be a warning to anyone who falls asleep in church. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened? What happened? In verse 10, Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and he put his arms around him, and he said... Don't be alarmed. He's alive. Then he went upstairs and broke bread and he ate again. See, breaking bread is just eating. Broke bread and they ate. And then after talking until daylight, he left. And verse 13 says, we went on to the ship and sailed for Asos where we we're going to take Paul abroad. Paul hiked 14 miles to Asos on Sunday morning to catch a ship. So why were they meeting on the first day of the week? Because he had been with them all day Sabbath. He was getting ready to leave, wanted to spend his last few precious moments with them. So he had another meeting Saturday night. And then Sunday morning he hiked to catch a ship that can hardly be understood as changing the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week. No. Paul didn't do it. Did the disciples... Did any of the disciples change the Sabbath? Chapter 13 of Acts. In Acts chapter 13, let's see if there's any evidence for that. In Acts chapter 13, the Bible says that Paul went to Antioch, and on the Sabbath day they entered the synagogue, sent down, and after reading from the law and the prophets, synagogue readers sent word to them saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. So here's Paul on the Sabbath going into the synagogue to worship. Now, I need to make something clear before we go any further as we talk about the Sabbath. I'm not saying that you can only worship on the Sabbath. I'm not saying that it's wrong to worship God any other day of the week. We should worship God every day of the week. Amen? Amen. This isn't talking about when you worship God. You worship God every day. Now, the Bible does say the Sabbath is a day of sacred assembly. It's a good day to come together and worship, but we should worship God every day, and it's never wrong to assemble together to worship God. Well, here we are assembled together on Sunday night. It's not wrong. But what we're talking about is that God rested on the seventh day and said, I want you to rest with me that's much broader than just going to church folks but today and that's what John Paul II was all worried about he said it's not a holy day anymore it's a holy hour well it isn't even that because Sunday isn't holy at all the seventh day is what's holy and maybe that's why it got condensed to a holy hour So Paul observed the Sabbath. And then they said, come back next week. Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue. The people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. Well, on the next Sabbath, verse 44, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. He didn't say, well, no, you don't have to wait till next Saturday. Tomorrow morning we're going to be meeting now. No, he didn't say that. On the next Sabbath they assembled. Fourteen years after the cross, and they're observing the Sabbath still. Well, some say, well, that's because there was a synagogue there and it was kind of handy to go. Well, we discover in chapter 16, verse 12, that Paul went to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of, what the, of the district of Macedonia. No synagogue there, so what did he do? On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river to find a place of prayer. 22 years after the cross, we've already seen three examples here of Paul observing the Sabbath on the seventh day still. 
In Thessalonica, chapter 17, verse 2, as his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from Scripture. Six times already we see them observing the Sabbath. Chapter 18, verse 1, Paul left Athens, went to Corinth. He met Aquila and Priscilla. He stayed and he worked with them. Verse 4, every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles, both together, worshiping together in the synagogue. Well, what are they doing there? We'll come back to that. Every Sabbath. How long was he there? Verse 11 tells us Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the Word of God. Do the math. A year and a half times 52 weeks. That's 78 times that he observed the Sabbath there, add the other six, 84 examples of disciples observing the seventh day of the week and zero examples of anybody ever observing and making holy the first day of the week. Jesus didn't change it. The disciples didn't change it. Well, who did? Well, I want to show you how it changed. But in order to do that, I have to close the book because it's not in here where is it well history tells us early in the history of the church we saw the Jews and the Gentiles worshiping together the church members worship together they didn't just immediately split off the church and the Jews the church were Jews but they accepted Jesus Christ and so there were, the only difference between the two was some of the Jews accepted Jesus. They were Christians. Other Jews didn't accept Jesus. They weren't Christians. But they were still worshiping together. But then, it wasn't until later when the Jews began to rebel against the Romans that the Romans came down hard on the Jews and began to persecute them. And when the Jews were being persecuted by the Romans, the Christians who were worshiping together with them got persecuted too because in the eyes of the Romans, the Sabbath was a sign of a Jew. And there were those Christians worshiping together with the Jews and they were getting persecuted because of what the Jews did. Now, they were not happy about that. And so they decided, hey, this isn't any fun. We don't want to worship with those guys anymore. We just keep getting beat up. So let's worship on our own. And they continued to observe the Sabbath, but they separated from the Jews. But they continued to get beat up and persecuted because they were observing the Sabbath. And the Sabbath in the eyes of the Romans was proof that they were still Jews. In fact, they turned so bitterly against the Jews in the early church, this is the beginning of anti-Semitism that we know today. And they turned bitterly against the Sabbath because it was the Sabbath that was causing the church to get persecuted. Barnabas, 135 A.D. Wretched men, those Jews who were deluded by an evil angel, were abandoned by God. They became anti-Jewish. Justin Martyr, 150. It was by reason of your sins, you Jews, and the sins of your father that God imposed on you the observance of the Sabbath as a mark. The purpose of this was that you and only you might suffer the afflictions that are now justly yours. The Bible never says the Sabbath is a curse. The Bible says it's a blessing. But the, the church had become so persecuted and turned so much against the Jews that it caused them to turn against the Sabbath. Now in Rome, all of these forces were converging. Because in Rome, there weren't that many Jews. In Rome, the church was mainly converts from the pagan religions where they worshipped the sun god on the day of the sun sunday and so they decided hey i'm tired of getting beat up because of these jews and because we keep the sabbath so let's keep the sabbath at home privately and have our worship services on sunday and we can do it in honor of the resurrection and furthermore, it'll make it a lot easier for us to witness to the rest of the pagans out there because they won't have to change a day and they won't have to become Jews in their mind and keep the Sabbath. It made a lot of sense to them. Didn't make sense to the Bible, but it made sense to them. So the church began to observe Sunday until Constantine in the 4th century became a nominal Christian 
And he passed Sunday laws enforcing Sunday worship and forbidding Sabbath worship. And that's how it all began. But the church finally met at the Council of Laodicea in 364 A.D. I've been talking about this for years and years, and finally when the Internet came out, I started searching around on the Internet. Still couldn't find it, but one day I found the Vatican website. And I started probing around in the archives of the Vatican and I found it right here. The Council of Laodicea, Canon 29. I printed it out so I could show you right here. Christians must not Judaize, be like Jews, by resting on the Sabbath. But they must work on that day and rather honor the Lord's Day Sunday. It was the church that officially decreed that the commandment to keep the Sabbath would now be observed by keeping Sunday. It was the church, the Roman church, the early church, the medieval church that began to substitute the tradition of Sunday for the observance of the Sabbath. That's why John Paul II could say, the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy, therefore Sunday is the Lord's day to keep holy. Did he think that it was Saturday? Did he think that Sunday was the seventh day of the week? No, because he tells us in the catechism that he endorsed. He said, Sunday worship fulfills the moral command of the Old Testament, taking up its rhythm and spirit in the weekly celebration of the Creator and Redeemer of His people. Well, how can he say that? What gives him the authority to say that? Down at the bottom of the page, the conference of bishops can abolish certain holy days and transfer them to Sunday with their own authority. The church has the authority to change the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week. That's how he can do it. What makes him think he can do that? The church does not derive her certainty about all revealed truth from the Scripture alone. No, both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal devotion and reverence. John Paul II says, we did it. We changed the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first. The Reverend John O'Brien, former dean of Notre Dame, of the, at the University of Notre Dame says, the Bible does not contain all the teachings of the Christian religion, nor does it formulate all the duties of its members. Take, for example, the matter of observing Sunday. Let me address my dear non-Catholic readers. So he's talking to Protestants. Now, you believe the Bible alone is a safe guide in religious matters. You believe that one of the fundamental duties enjoined on you by your Christian faith is that of Sunday observance. Where does the Bible speak of such an obligation? I've read it from Genesis to Revelation. I found no reference to the duty of sanctifying Sunday in the Bible. No, the day mentioned in the Bible is not Sunday, the first day of the week, but Saturday, the seventh day of the week. It was the church, the church, which changed the observance to Sunday in honor of the day on which Christ rose from the dead. The church. But does the church, does the pastor and preacher have the authority to change one of God's commandments? Can the church do that? God knew that this was going to happen, folks. He knew it. In case you're wondering about what this has to do with Revelation, the beast and the little horn are the same. And Daniel 7, 25, looking ahead to the work of the little horn of the beast, he would think to change the set times and the laws. The beast would try to change God's set times and laws. And now we've seen exactly how it happened. And Rome even boasts about having the authority to do it. Well, pastor, why do all the Protestants still keep Sunday? Because they stand on the Scripture and the Scripture alone. Good question. What do the Protestants think about what we have just read? 
I'm going to read to you from the printout to save time here. These are all in your printout, so you'll be able to go back and look. Here's one Methodist scholar. Dr. Binney wrote the Methodist Episcopal Theological Compendium, and you have to be able to say that in order to graduate from seminary. He said, it is true, there is no positive command in the Bible for keeping holy the first day of the week. Christian Church, Dr. Alexander Campbell, founder of the Christian Church, wrote in the reporter, now there is no testimony in all the oracles of heaven, Sabbath has changed, that Sunday came in its place. None. Baptist. There was and is a commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day, but that Sabbath was not Sunday. It will, however, be readily said that with some show of triumph that the Sabbath was changed from the seventh day to the first day of the week. I ask, where can the record of that change be found? Not in the New Testament. Absolutely not. There's no scriptural evidence for the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh day to the first day of the week. Of course, I know how it happened early in Christian history from the Christian fathers, but what a pity it comes branded with a mark of paganism and christened by the name, with the name of the sun god, then adopted and sanctified by the papal apostasy and bequeathed as a sacred legacy to Protestantism, Dr. E.T. Hiscock, Baptist scholar who wrote the Baptist manual. They agree with what I'm saying tonight. No real Bible scholar will try to argue that Saturday's not the Sabbath day, folks. That's a fact. They won't. They know they can't. Well, why do they keep Sunday? I don't know. I can't answer that. I just know that I want to follow the Lamb and the Word of God. In fact, I found this on the Internet. Let me just share, share this with you. This came from WorldNet Daily. This is about eight years ago. There's a pastor in Illinois who started with $50,000 of his own money for anyone who could produce a verse from the Holy Bible showing that God commands us to keep holy the first day of the week, Sunday, instead of the seventh day, Saturday. 50000 You want to get rich fast? Find one verse. 50000 Now watch this. It gets better. He will increase in $25,000 increments every week, capping it off at a million. So you want a million dollars? It's still out there. All you need to do is find one verse that shows from the Bible Sabbath was changed from the seventh day to the first day of the week. Dr. James Erfurt, professor of biblical interpretation at Duke University Divinity School, said, I'm afraid you're not going to find an exact Bible verse to counter the good pastor's challenge and collect the reward. As far as I know, there is no verse which specifies that Sunday is the day for Christians to observe the Sabbath. So the question to me is, do I want to follow the lamb or follow man's traditions? Follow the lamb.